Isaiah 62, verses 10 through 12. And here we go. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Now, these are marvelous promises of the Lord and the promises to the daughter of Zion. And it's to us because in Hebrews 12 it says, We have come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, and to the church of the firstborn and in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. So it applies to us according to the scriptures that we are part of God's heavenly Jerusalem, his Zion. And he says to go through the gates. Now, these are the gates of men's hearts. And in Isaiah, in a Psalms, the 24th Psalm, it says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye left up, ye everlasting doors. Well, even the, ga even the walls of Jerusalem of the old city, as sturdy as they are, are show signs of wear. They are not everlasting. They are long-lasting, but not everlasting. And the ever, only everlasting gates there are the gates of the human heart. Now, we want paradise. Every one of us wants paradise. We have some kind of a vision or a dream that we follow in life, whether uh, until it gets knocked out of us by s experience or crushed or drowned in lust or dope or sex or something else. But if this doesn't happen to us and we keep going, we have a dream that we're following. We have something that spurs us on, uh, s some kind of a city or a hope or or something out there that keeps us going. And God gives us that to give some more to life than eating and sleeping. He gives us something that keeps us going. Many times these are false goals, things that are not real, things that will never bring us what we want. And But as we pray to the Lord and he refines our desires in his fire, we end up with a true goal, and it's, you can call it heaven, you can call it whatever you want to, but it's what keeps us going, keeps us alive, pressing on toward that, that thing, that, that hope, that something that burns all in us. And God refines that thing, and then he gives us the desire of our heart. And if it's hell we want, it's hell we get. And if it's the presence of God we want, it's the presence of God we get, because he gives us the desires of our heart. He opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. Never give up your dreams. I tell you, I have no use whatever for, for inevitability. Jesus said in Gethsemane, in a, and that's a proper setting for the saying, I know, Father, that all things are possible with you. And that's true. And the right setting for that is Gethsemane. Because when we come unto God, and that's the way God has made the world, uh, the sons of God, to see what the stuff is in man, that he, as, we, as God gives us a challenge and something to go forward toward and a dream and a vision, uh, we're made in that, in that arena, and we win if we play the game right. If we play the game right with God and with people, we win. We get whatever God has put in our heart. If it's of God, we go. Never let life beat that out of you. And never get a spirit of inevitability. Well, I guess this is the way it is, and this is the way circumstances are. Resist that with all your might. With God, all things are possible. Father, I know that all things are possible with you. Hallelujah. And so life does beat our dreams out of us. But... Don't let it do that to you. You can have the strength to accomplish what it is that God puts in your heart if you'll pray 
and God will renew your vision. Don't ever get swept away with the circumstances. This is the way it has to be. It doesn't have to be that way. Keep your dreams sharp and clear and follow that thing. And Jesus talks so much about that. You have not because you ask not. Ask, seek, knock, keep it up, keep it up. He that asks shall receive. He that seeks that find shall find, and he that knocks it shall be open. And in the most unlikely times and in the most unlikely ways, and it seems like life is, is moving you this way or that way, and there's no hope and it'll never happen, God can change it in a moment. How many know that's true? Don't ever forget your dreams, and don't ever give up, and don't ever take a setback as a sign that that's God's will. That's not God's will until God says it's his will. Setbacks are not God's will until he says they're his will. Setbacks are not God's will until he says they're his will. It can be just to try your soul. Stay with it. Stay with it. And God will see you through. And the right setting is Gethsemane. You'll be made in the process because everything. You see what Jesus said, Father, let it pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And the worst came to pass, and then the best came to pass. He got what he wanted. But I had to go through the fire. Do you see what I'm saying? I guess that many wasn't the end of the road. He lost everything and then gained everything. He got what he wanted. God, he shall see the travail of his soul, the Bible says, and shall be satisfied. Praise the Lord. So we're in hardy times. I mean, this is not easy. People are giving up. And if you give up, if you faint in the day of adversity, what does the Bible say? Your strength is small. Get up off the canvas. What are you doing laying down there? Get up. Put your head down and start swinging. Get up. The fight isn't over yet. Just uh, God can take, can will give you what you want if you stay with it, and if you're willing to be, if you're willing to be moved by the Lord and guided by Him, He'll bring you forth. He's looking for sons, not pussy cats. He's looking for people who, in, who in the untold ages to come, will bring reality uh, into being. The reality that God gives, and not by any words of faith, but by prayer and by faith in God. And what they want will come to pass. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. All things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. So don't quit. And don't accept anything as being inevitable. Take it to God in prayer. Take it to God in prayer. And keep it in prayer before God. And God will give you the desire of your heart. And that's what the scripture says. Now we want paradise. And God will give us paradise. Paradise was taken from us by cunning, by deceit. But paradise in the beginning shows us what God wants, what God has for man. This crazy world in which we live was never God's intention. It was never God's intention. Eden is what God had in mind. But we lost it. But our Redeemer has come. Praise the Lord. And he's redeeming us to God because God lost us. And he's redeeming paradise to us because we lost paradise and God. And Jesus is redeeming all things. The time of the restoration of all things, it says, which does not mean that everybody will be saved, unfortunately, but it does mean that those who follow God will get back everything that was lost and the double portion on top of that. But what God is concerned about first, first, is righteousness. Righteousness. Paradise comes after righteousness. Peace and joy come after righteousness. We want our goals. We want our vision to be fulfilled. God wants righteousness. And that's why it seems sometimes like we're going backward. We have that goal out there. But God has something else that's more important than that we get what we want, and that's righteousness. When we fit God's criteria 
for righteousness, holiness, and obedience to him, then God will give us all things. He that spared not his own son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So this time of denial and of thirst and of frustration and of confusion and of pain is for the sake of righteousness and holiness and obedience to God. And without that, paradise is hell. You bring one gossiper into paradise, you brought hell into it. You bring one liar into paradise, you brought hell into it. You, you bring one complainer and, and murmur and grumbler and violent man into paradise and you've brought hell into it. Our goal is not paradise. It's, it's external. It's to get the thing right inside. The relationship's inside, right inside of us. Does that make sense to you? Makes sense to Hank. Doesn't it make sense to anybody else? All right. So that's what the Lord is talking about here. Righteousness, which is the way we behave with people, uprightness, honesty, doing what we'll say, straightforwardness, not being sneaky, not seeking to get our way over people. It's righteousness, uprightness. Man, that is so important that we not play games with one another, but that we be straight, straight, and the second thing is holiness. And that is our relationship to God. Holiness has to do with spirits. It has to do with whether our spirit is clean or dirty. Holiness has to do with our acceptability to God as, as belonging uniquely to him and having no trace of darkness in us. No trace of darkness or dirtiness of any kind in us. Nope. No kind of spiritual uncleanness or spiritual marriage in us or soul tie or anything completely cleansed from all that is unholy and the third is obedience to God and we learn that in the fire too that even if we're righteous and holy we must also be ready to do that which God says whether it fits our plans or whether it doesn't whether it hurts or whether it feels good whether it makes sense or whether it's ridiculous whether anything when we know that it's God's will, we do it, and we do it with all of our might, as it is written, Yea, I delight to do thy will, O God, thy law is within my heart. And God wants that spirit of the Messiah saying that in every one of us. Yea, I delight to do thy will, O God, thy law is within my heart. And God wants that in every Christian. Righteousness, square dealing with people, upright, clear, transparent dealing with people, Upright, clear, transparent, dealing with people, not games, not Jacob seeking the, advan the advantage. Holiness, spiritual cleanliness before God, getting rid of the things that God esteems to be unclean in our actions and in our words, in our tongue, and in our thoughts and minds. Holy before the Lord, holy before the Lord. And finally, absolute obedience. And Jesus didn't have to learn righteousness or holiness in the earth, but he did learn obedience. And he learned it by the things which he suffered until we say, God, not my will, but thine be done, that it rips the heart out of us. God, not my will, but thine be done. God set Jesus at his right hand with all authority, but first he had to learn obedience. And God wants to exalt us who are common and nothing at all, uh, and every Christian to his right hand with authority and glory, but first we must learn obedience. And these things are the internal kingdom, and they must come before the external kingdom. A rapture is folly and madness until God develops righteousness, holiness, and obedience in his people. It would only be lifting up confusion into paradise, it was not going to happen. It is not, we're not ready for any rapture today at all whatsoever. God is ready today to baptize his people with fire, and he's baptizing you with fire and me with fire, isn't he? And we're not talking academics. We're talking about what's going on. What's going, if it hasn't happened yet, be of good cheer. <laughs> 
<laughs> the joy of the Lord is your strength. What you'll be surprised at is where your problem comes from and the nature of it. You say, well, I could take anything but this. Ah, oh, the Lord is so smart. <laughs> he doesn't push buttons that aren't going anywhere. <laughs> oh, glory. That was better to laugh than weep. <laughs> well, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. But it's always a surprise where it comes from. I don't recognize that. That's, that's, that's not the Lord, you know. What's happening to you is the Lord, but not this stuff. This is, you know, this is the machinations of people here. It's their doings. This is not the Lord. The Lord wouldn't have this happen to me. Well, we all feel the same way, and we're all in the same boat that way. So it says in Isaiah 62, go through the gates. Jesus is at the door today as the king of glory in the fulfillment of the feast of trumpets and the spiritual fulfillment of the feast of trumpets. Jesus stands at the door of your heart. And he wants to come in. He doesn't want to come in so you'll do great and mighty works. I see in my Bible, it says, abide in him, and then he'll answer your prayer so you can get your prayers answered. Jesus entering into us is not a means to an end. It's our destiny. And he enters in to do what? To dine with us, to dine with us, to dine with us upon his own body and blood, to dine with us. So we're brought into total union. It's a marriage, and he's seeking total union. Total union, total union. The Lord is after total union. And he comes uh, into this holy place. And the Bible says, cast out, uh, clear the way for the people. Now, somebody has to do that. There are always pioneers when there's a new territory to be developed. And it is our opportunity today to pioneer. Now, I suppose every generation has had something to pioneer in the kingdom and to cast out the stones. And in our generation, we have something to pioneer. We are preaching things that have not been preached before. They're in the Bible, certainly, but they have not been preached before. The spiritual fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. I've lived long enough to see the change from Reckon Yourself Dead, which was advanced, in, uh, for example, in Prairie Bible Institute. And uh, I think it was a fellow named Maxwell, as I remember, wrote Born Crucified. Now, that was a uh, bestseller in 1940, 1950 or so around in there. And that was all we had. Born Crucified, Reckon Yourself Dead. It, was, it came as a revelation. That, that, see, because all of us want to be holy, every true Christian deplores his conduct. And always say, why, you know, am I doing this? I don't believe in it, you know. I can't even believe that I did this. It's wrong. What am I doing this for? You know, this uh, thing. And so this thing came out uh, by Maxwell, born crucified, that, that God has reckoned our sinful nature dead in it. And if we would just enter into that rest in God and believe that, that God would deal with this and we could rejoice without condemnation and not be all the time striving and straining and losing in our battle with sin. That was in 1950. And then after that, God began a new thing to us. Not, it's been in other places. Some of you may have read the Calvary Road, Calvary Road by Roy Hessian and, and the revival of repentance and, and con open confession of sins that took place. Uh, in Africa, in a certain place. And so, so it isn't new to the world, but it was new to us that we were not supposed to just reckon ourselves dead. We were supposed to confess our sins. And that's today. God is coming to his church. Not to talk about forgiveness only, but to talk about cleansing and to talk about obedience and to talk about judgment on us, not the world, on us. We're the ones that are being judged. And it's important that we understand what's going on. Are we blame people or blame God or think it's bad luck or the devil won? And of course, this stuff, that's all the devil, it's all the devil. If you have faith, it won't happen. Is That's a spur track. It's not right. That's not right. God uses the devil, but we're dealing with God. He's the ones who's judging us. And he said it plainly. John said it. 
uh, uh, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He will purge his floor. And, he, and God's doing that today, and he's cutting down the trees that have been built in us, uh, trees of unrighteousness. And it comes about through pain and confusion, and, and we can't understand. Our, our Christian life has blown to smithereens. And we can't understand, what is happening in my life? I don't understand this dealing. That's why the question is raised. Who is this king of glory? We don't understand this. We thought he was the Christ of the 23rd Psalm, and he's going to anoint our head with oil. And instead he comes in as a man of war and blows everything apart. What is this thing that's going on? See, it's new, but it is our responsibility in our day, and you can only serve God in your own generation, and it is our responsibility in this generation to take this thing that God is doing and to explain it to ourselves as best we can and to others as best we can. And to cast out the stones. And to help other people cast out the stones. Uh, you'll find uh, that as Paul has been teaching on a reproach, and that's very, very true. Whenever God moves as a reproach, there's no reproach uh, uh, today on tongues to speak of. You go, you know, into a high church somewhere, Episcopal, Catholic, or whatever, and the priest is speaking in tongues. There's, there's no reproach on that but when you begin to tell people that God is not ready for a rapture but he's ready for a judgment on his people you find out what reproach is all about they'll say you know crawl back into the woodwork you know wherever you came from because you are a loser we're without condemnation tra la la as they skip around and the next time you see them they're lowering a snake's belly because it caught up with them and they say, what hit me? You know, has anybody found God? <laughs> well, it's all we have to do is tell what God is doing. It's up to God to do it. It's not words. It's what God does. And so God's doing it in your, wor in your world, in your heart, and you're hurting. And you're confused. You say, I don't understand why God would deal with me like that. Well, he's teaching you righteousness and holiness and obedience, and you can say it with your mouth, but you have to learn it in your in your heart. And most of us aren't perfect. So don't get too swift in criticizing other people. You know, because you may be pointing the finger at yourself. And you may, when you swept your head around to, uh, to examine the moat in your brother's eye, you may have flattened 15 people with the beam out of your own eye. <laughs> So go slow before you spend time evaluating other people. Yeah? Yeah, I thought you'd like that. All right. <laughs> go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people. Build up the highway. Now, in our day, as Jesus said, or the scripture says, uh, that straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads uh, to life, it's narrow, it's hard to find, and when you get in there, it's all compressed. But broad is the road that leads to destruction, and God wants to reverse that. He wants to make it, he, he wants today a highway to be built so that it is easy to serve the Lord. And it will be that way in the kingdom age, it'll be easy to serve the Lord and hard to sin, just the reverse of what it is today. But it has to begin somewhere, so it's beginning with us. Good luck. <laughs> and God, see, every time somebody sees you overcome sin, it's easier for them. See, when, when, when they were starting to develop the United States, and the big goal was the Ohio Valley because of the trees and the farmland there, and the people were New England were casting covetous eyes on the Ohio Valley, and you've all read about Johnny Appleseed and so on. That was a heavy thing to go from Connecticut or New York or Vermont to Ohio. I mean, you went at the peril of your life. But as more and more people went, the Mississippi was developed, it became easier and easier, but the original men were mountain men. I mean, they were crude dudes. Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to use that word. All right. They were crude people. <laughs> I mean, you've seen some of them. You couldn't tell. 
you know, there was more hair on their face than there was on their jacket. It was, they, were, they were bearded men with long rifles and knives that knew the Indians, and they didn't bring along their wife and daughter. I mean, they lived out there with the bears and the and, uh, wolverines. But then, as they developed trails and it became safe, and uh, the different nations were conquered there, the uh, uh, natives and and the animals were driven into the forest, deeper in the forest, and so on, and some of the ruts were taken out of the roads, then people could begin to bring their families, uh, men that were stable men, that were not wanderers, would come and bring their families and, and hew down some of the trees there and make a cabin for themselves and begin to set up civilization. And, of course, now going from New York to Ohio, is all you're worried about is whether you're going to have a snack or a, or a lunch on your ticket. So... That's the way things change. And it's that way now. You never thought you'd be a mountain man with more hair on your face than on your jacket, did you? But that's where we are, and we're going to make a lot of mistakes, and some of us are going to get killed because we're pioneering. And we're pioneering against vicious, hostile tribes of demons that they've had their way in the earth. And they don't intend to uh, be dispossessed by you. They do not intend to be dispossessed at all by you. And so that's where we are. And we're, we're uh, pioneering. We're casting up a way for the people. Now, everyone in the kingdom is not a soldier. Everyone in the kingdom of God is not a mighty man of valor. Everyone in Israel was not one of David's mighty men. God is calling forth mighty men. This is the day for the mighty men. The, 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 the average settlers will come later, but this way will have been prepared by you. That's why I get so excited and begin to roar and snort when people are not doing what they're supposed to because you're weak in the hands of the men of war. Other people see you and you say, well, you know, I don't have to live like that. And somebody else hears you and they figure, well, I don't have to live like that. And we influence one another. And when people see you getting the victory over the television or the victory over smoking or the, or the victory over swearing or something else, then they, it does something to them. It rubs off on people. But when they see you and, and you say, well, I don't need to do what they say there. You know, I can still run around as I please and do what I please. Then it influences people. And you weaken the hands of the men of war. That's why I don't like people coming and doing musical specials. It weakens the hands of the men of war. It affects us. And God wants us learning strength, not being entertained, so that we will be strong in the Lord. And every time you gain a victory in Christ, you save yourself and those who hear you. You don't do it alone. You save yourself and those who hear you. And until you do, you are making it more difficult for those around you because they have to fight off the devil and carry your load also. So we all affect one another. And as it says, you, you lift up a standard, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples, and it makes me think of the sisters. You see the sisters in, in their militancy, and they come with their banners, and it does something for you, doesn't it? If you, I could do that too. I could get the victory too. But you know, if they'd been coming and they were all, you know, not living for God or anything, then it just uh, wouldn't do a thing for you. But their devotion and their militancy puts militancy in you. So we affect one another. All right. Lift up a standard over the peoples. Now, I want to digress just a moment uh, while we're on this topic. Now, God's great desire for us is that the Lord enter into our hearts and that the sin gets out and the gains get out and so on. And we have to go to the scripture to find out how God does that. And, and one thing that we have really emphasized in this church is it is a good thing to confess your sins. We confess our sins one to another. And for a husband to his wife, it's a good thing. Some men still don't pray with their wives. Pray with your wife, for goodness sake. Nothing will bite you. Have some time during the day, even if it's only five minutes, that you pray with your wife. 
And it's a good idea for men to confess their sins to their wife and for wives to confess their sins. And we should have that kind of uh, relationship and also with people in the church. Now, God will get some of it out of us by suffering and some of it out of us by just simply education. We say, oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. I won't do it anymore. And some of it is by deliverance as we confess our sins and God changes our spirit. And sometimes we're strengthened through the word. The word just comes and drops into us and it breaks the yoke. Have you ever had that happen to you? I have. I mean, just a preacher didn't even know what happened. It just come out of him and bang, it hit me and set something free in me. So God has all these ways. So I'm not going to make any schedule of performance except that it, the Bible says it will happen in the last days. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And in Hebrews 9, uh, in the last verse, to them that look for him shall he appear without sin unto salvation. And in Ephesians, uh, it says, it speaks about your seal unto the day of redemption. So the Bible keeps talking about this day when we'll be redeemed. Well, I've got news for you. This day has started. I just never thought it would start in my lifetime, but it has started. And we're going through it. Kind of a first fruits. I don't mean just this church. I mean people worldwide are going through this, whether they understand it or not. They're going to go through suffering, and suffering is going to be poured out on the United States and on the rest of the world, and we are coming to a time of travail when the whole world is in travail. The Jews will be in travail. The Christians will be in travail. Everything will be in travail, and there's going to be revival, and there's going to be trouble. Then finally, there'll come the rule of Antichrist, and then will come the end. It'll be the greatest revival of all time, and then Antichrist, and then the end, as I understand the scriptures. But we are in the beginning now when the Lord has come to baptize us with fire. According to Malachi 3, the Lord whom you see, the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord, who may abide the day of his appearing, for he shall be sit as a, a, a refiner uh, and uh, as a wash us with fuller soap to purify the sons of Levi, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And this is happening today, the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Trumpets Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. How many have experienced anything like that? Are you having a wonderful time? Uh, everything going swimmingly? I hope so. But if not, take heart. Probably the Lord's dealing with you. Now, I said I want to digress for a moment. There's something that I've been pondering, and I'm just inviting you into my thinking. I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord on this, but Audrey and I have been discussing this. I've discussed it with Pastor James and with Chad uh, recently. Uh, Bob Porcelli gave me an article that had to do with this subject recently. And what I'm talking about is covenant. Now, at first blush, this sounds wonderful. And no one preaches uh, uh, relationships, I don't think, any harder than I, because I know that the kingdom primarily is relationships, and after that is everything else. And as far as union is concerned, we know what the scripture says, that they may be one as we are, and so on. So I'm a great believer in that. Uh, first of all, uh, but before I talk directly about that, I want to talk about uh, something that's kind of related to it. And that is, as we're getting into our prayer groups, and uh, different ones want to start prayer groups, and I think that's great. That's wonderful, and I don't want to discourage that in any way. The greatest thing is to pray. I have asked that people let me know so it will be on my calendar, and that as far as possible, that men be in charge. Especially, uh, I don't think it's particularly seemly for a man and his wife to be there and the woman to be in charge. I have not seen good fruit from that. I have nothing against the ladies, but I don't think it brings good fruit. Then into the home, I think it makes problems. The woman becomes very vocal, and American males do have a tendency to sit back and let their wife yak, and, the, and, it, and it gets... You know, and so to have a woman running a prayer meeting, if her husband is present, I don't know, is, is a healthy thing for the household. Uh, then when they go home, then I think it carries in and so on. But anyway, uh, I have nothing against the ladies whatsoever. Foursquare was started by a lady. I have no hang up on that at all. Now, in the case of a single lady that wants to start a prayer group, I think that she needs to come to Audrey and me and tell, me, tell us about it so she'll have some kind of covering. Uh, so that we can be praying about it, we can know what's going on, and we can have it on our calendar. And furthermore, I think we should get to the place where we're announcing these things on 
uh, are right when we announce meetings, because otherwise we get into little affinity groups. Do you know what I mean by that? Little groups of people that we love, and that's not hell. That's not spiritual. That's of the soul. Affinities and antipathies, people we naturally like and naturally don't like, are of the soul. That's of the soul. That is not of the Spirit of God. You can prophesy to yourself till tomorrow morning, that is not of the Spirit of God. The best thing in the world for you is to have somebody to come into your meeting that you despise. The most healthy thing. Because it will rule out all this little, uh, this little clatch thing. See, and it's just us four. So don't, I'm not saying, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to bring anybody into bondage at all, but beware of developing a, a little group that is just people that you know and naturally like. Invite someone that you hate, and, and it will, it will, uh, you'll be surprised. They'll bring, the bless, they'll bring the biggest blessing of the evening. You watch and see. Because you don't like them, but God does. They're different from you, and they're distinctly different from your personality. So beware of antipathies and affinities for people, or you naturally like, you naturally don't like. Don't, that's soulishness. And you get a blessing, that person you don't like at all because they're not your style. There's a blessing in there for you. There's a blessing for you in that person. And so make an extra effort to, uh, uh, to get to know and to like people that you instinctively don't like because they don't dress like you or talk like you or they're not in your social level or whatever. All right. And everybody said, Amen. So when, so when you start a prayer meeting... Please let us know. Let us put it on the calendar. And unless you have serious objections, we'd like to announce in the church so people that have a desire to go and pray will come. Now, this will save you from a lot of mistakes and, and, and developing little things that ought not to be developed, that are unwholesome and may cause problems down the trail. And you know what I mean. All right. Now, there's nothing against that people want to have food and have a little social together. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good for people as long as it doesn't steer the church. You know, the church is for spiritual things. But people have social needs if they want to get together and have uh, uh, coffee and donuts or hot chocolate or whatever. That's their business as people to live in that. And I would say in that situation, avoid gossip the instant. Somebody starts to gossip or talk about somebody or criticize, it's incumbent on the hostess to lead them off from that and to get on something positive. Do you see what I'm saying? Because it's a temptation there. Have your fun and have a good time and enjoy one another, but be very careful because when your guard is down, uh, especially if there's tension around you in any way, uh, it will lapse into that kind of thing, and you'll feel it will bring the joy and the fun right down, and it just become a gossip session, and it's not healthy. And you know that as well as I. So we're not trying to say things to hinder you, but to help you and guide you and spare you from things that are not healthy. That's all. That's all. We want people to pray. and that, uh, If there are 25 prayer groups going, praise the Lord. We've asked some people, if possible, if it's convenient and the time is right to come here in the church and pray before the service. Move it here. I love to have people pray here. And the more that pray here, the better. But you'll have to see. Sometimes geographically or for some other reason, that's not possible. Now, what I, well, these two areas that I want to get into, the first one is uh, really a part of the second. When we have a prayer meeting, whether it's here in the church or whether it's home, and we're talking now about casting the stones out. We're getting into an area of this thing. I, I think it is a mistake to call out people's sins if they are not present. Or if they are present even. Because if you're in prayer and you say, I discern this person has a spirit of murder, let's pray for it. That may sound innocent to you. It's about as innocent as a baby alligator. It's about as innocent as a baby alligator. Because for the rest of your life, you will view that person as a murderer. It becomes an accomplished fact. And when that person finds out that you said that in the prayer meeting, you're going to give them a tremendous hurdle to jump. On top of that, you may be incorrect. 
So, at, so we don't know. So we're learning. We're learning. Don't, this is not the way you cast out the stones. You don't call out people, say, I discern, or come up to somebody and say, I discern you have a spirit of whatever, or this is wrong with you. You can give people years of depression and anxiety and guilt and fear and a victim complex by one instance of coming up to them and saying, this is wrong with you. This is how I see you. This is how I discern you. It's wrong. Don't do it. God has not called you in this way to cast the stone out of their life. It doesn't work. You know from experience that the, how gentle God is with you and how the Lord will deal with you for 10 or 15 years. And gradually you become aware that something's wrong. Slowly you become aware. And when you're about saying, Lord, I've got to know what this is, then he tells you. And best of all, he gives you the grace so that it's fun and right and satisfying to get rid of it. But when you come up to somebody with your gift of discernment, and the odds are pretty heavy, it's not discernment, but it is your intuition. See, it's a soulish, metaphysical thing that's operating. It's, it's your intuition. And you're not skillful or experienced enough to discern between it and a true gift. It's your, it's your natural, soulish, psychical uh, way in which you do. And you have this, you say, I think that's right. And you go tell that person, God hasn't prepared them. And you don't have the grace to help them. And you can do tremendous damage. Well, what you have done is you have satisfied the irritation of your personality regarding that person in a, in a guise of religion so that it would be acceptable to your mind. What you have done is you've vented your irritation. This was your opportunity. Now, I think you'll find that, that Audrey and I seldom, if ever, have come up to someone and said, your problem is so-and-so. I don't think many of you have heard that. If you've ever heard anything like that, it's because you asked us our opinion. But we learned many years ago that people do not get delivered until they themselves say, the Lord has shown me this is wrong with me. And so when we pray with people at home in our front room, what we do is we pray about the things that the Lord shows them. And we may say, uh, has the Lord spoken to you along this line? Uh, uh, I'll say this. I'll say this is a guess. I'm just guessing. It, does this ring with you? If not, throw it out. There's a lot of power and judgment when two people to get together to pray for you. And then I think those of you who have sat in the prophet's chair in our front room, have uh, have know that this is the way that Audrey and I have worked. We have asked you, what do you think is the problem? Because until you're convinced, all it does is build up toward that person who accuses you a dislike and a guilt trip if you are a, a, a weak soul or have a victim complex it builds up in you a fear and a paranoia that is not necessary. So there's a couple of things here about casting out the stones. Don't call out people's sins by discernment. Don't do that. Now, that could conceivably be done in the church if you have a proven gift that the elders recognize as a gift, but then it would be so destructive and demolishing to the recipient of your accusation that I cannot see where fruit would come from it even in the church. Unless, you know, it's on the status of like Ananias and Sapphira where Peter says, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? But, I, but that's an apostolic thing and that isn't bound to happen every Sunday. So, let's now, as far as sitting in a group and deciding to confess your sins one to another, I would, I would... Uh, I would, uh, at this present time, until God shows me better, I would inveigh against this. I don't think it's healthy. 
If you want to confess your sins, either your husband or wife, or someone whom you trust, one person. Because if you, because, see, these home groups are going to invite to this, because this is in the air. Now I want to get to, to the central issue here, which is the idea of covenant. Now, I do not see in the New Testament, and I'm willing to be shown, I'm willing to be shown, I don't know everything, that people made a covenant with one another. I don't see it. I mean, I'm open, you know. I'll do a search on my computer, but I don't think it's there. Okay? So, first of all, when we talk about people making a covenant with each other, and I've talked to James and Chad about this, and I'm not shooting at anybody. I'm talking about something that's in the air and that is being done. And I would rather use the term commitment, but not in the sense of a covenant. I think when we commit ourselves to do something in the church, if we say, I'm going to come and I'm going to mow the grass or something, I think we should either do what we say or not say it. So I think we owe it with people to be honest with them and to do what we say we're going to do. We owe that to people. I believe that. When something goes forth out of our mouth, <laughs> that's it. As far as I'm concerned and, you know, unless it's absolutely impossible, you do what comes out of your mouth. Commitment. But the covenant concept, not in every case, not in the case of Ed Bartz. That was more or less a commitment of people that come to the church, and we're moving in that way. And if you apply for church membership, you may find that from now on we're going to be asking you to come uh, to meet with us, uh, with the elders, not in any threatening sense, but just to discuss with you how you view the church, what your commitment to the church will be, not to put you in any bondage. But to hear before, we've just said, if you want to join the church, fine. Uh, we'll go through uh, myself and through the council, and if nobody knew anything about you, uh, fine, that's it. We might not even know you. Well, I don't think we're going to do this anymore. We feel the need for more commitment on the part of people. And we're, we are, uh, we are, the council is thinking about ways in which we can help one another, either on a buddy system or uh, first it will be initially by uh, your reception by the council. We, we hear you, we, we know who you are, and a little bit about you. In a, not in any threatening or accusing thing, but we just want to know where you're coming from. And if you join this church, because you represent this church. Okay, does that sound right to you? That's the direction we're moving. And that's a direction into openness and communication and commitment. You know, it's a responsibility to belong to this church. We're going to be asking you to do things as you have talents and as you have the time. And, of course, most of these people work here anyway. We haven't had to do any big deal about it. But we want it to mean something and that we have a responsibility to you. And we want to have it so that no one in this church is sick or something else happened to them and nobody knows about it. And Rosemary and Bill have an office in this respect, but they need help. And we also ought to have someone who knows if there's something wrong with you, or if they see you slipping away, that they'll say, hey, what are you doing? Right now you can be in this church and be invisible spiritually and hide. But we don't want it that way. We want it so there's other people who are meddling in your business. <laughs> I say, come on, you, you, know, uh, you, uh, you, you know, there's a look in your eye. It isn't the same as it used to be. Uh, what's going on here? But that's an act of love. And it says uh, to uh, reprove one another and exhort to love and good works. And that's the direction that we want to go, is toward that kind of openness. Now, and the thing that Bob Porcelli brought to me, uh, for me to review, and in other things that I've heard, I begin to feel uncomfortable. And now, now Bob was not selling this. He just, whenever Bob finds anything that he thinks that would be interesting, he Xerox it and gives it to me for my education. So Bob was not advocating this. Don't, don't misunderstand me. He gave me an article about a current uh, uh, essay. It was a current essay on some people that had made a covenant with one another. And I began to feel uncomfortable about it. I thought, there's something here that is troubling me. And I want to mention this because this conceivably could come out of a prayer group. C could come out of a prayer group, this kind of thing. And it reminds me, I think it was in the 60s, um, when we went through this big sensitivity and encounter bit, how many remember that? 
this, the sensitivity and encounter thing. And one of our boys had a very unpleasant experience in school because the teacher had done uh, some kind of a sensitivity encounter operation with her children, and it just wiped out my oldest boy. He came home so depressed. I guess everybody told him what they thought of him, and he just um, did him in. It did not help, but it uh, was very demoralizing for his self-image. Now, this was heavy, and you, and you sit in a hot spa, and everybody uh, uh, strips away the facades. And I've heard some talk of that in this church. We want, we want to take away the masks. And I want to suggest to you that to give some thought to that, what you're saying. First of all, it's not scriptural. It's not scriptural. Secondly, I think, and I've got to think more. I said I'm inviting you into my thinking today. I've got to do some more thinking about it. But I think if I'm not mistaken, this idea of getting together with other people and entering into a covenant, not in a commitment sense, but in the sense of exposing yourself and your personality, saying whatever you think, so there are no masks. This is how I feel, and this is how I feel about you is a kind of a superhumanism. I don't think it's the Lord. I don't think it's what the Lord wants. And I don't think it's good. Now, as I say, I'm willing to be shown. I'm still praying about it. But I felt I should discuss this this morning, at least to start you thinking about it. And I would suggest in the prayer groups that you stay away from this until, until as a church, we're satisfied this is God. For one thing, it will give a leader tremendous power over people. If a leader can get people to strip down themselves psychologically in front of one another, then the leader can manipulate this situation because the people become defenseless. The communists use this for this reason. It's the way they keep people in line is by constant confessionals, constant confession in which people say, you know, at one time I was a capitalist, but now I hate these rotten capitalists. And by this constant confessional, the leadership can keep these people transparent and keep them helpless before one another. If a guy has any kind of an independent thought and he doesn't confess it to the group, pretty soon the guilt sets in on him. He sits there thinking, boy, you know, everybody's telling everything they know. I better tell them that I'm thinking this. And pretty soon he's blatting out everything that's in him. It's very powerful group dynamic. It's a very powerful dynamic, and it changes people's behavior. And it was this kind of thing that I kind of picked up from the article that these Christians had decided to do this in the idea, and it said that if, if light comes from one person, what would happen if you had all these people in community, in covenant, so that they were one? It would increase the radiance of light. Well, I know that's wrong. That part I know, because... Uh, two people are not stronger than one in when God gets to move. In fact, God deliberately limits people so that that won't happen. Power comes from God, not by Christians holding hands. God's way is to take one man and separate him, call him into the desert, and make him an adversary to the rest of the church. Just as Paul was an adversary to the whole church. A, a ministry basically is an adversary position. It basically, is, it's, it's not basically a position of, of uh, community. It's basically an adversary position. God, all right, you know, God works with prophets. And he has prophets over people. And over those prophets are other prophets which are tougher than the prophet down here. And over the, these two sets of prophets are prophets which are harder than these down here. And so on up till you get to Jesus, who's the hardest prophet of all. And he says to all the prophets, I rebuke you. And they all get rebuked. Now, every one of these prophets is an adversary to the others. And that's why a minister is always called out into the desert. So that when he comes back, he doesn't wait to hear what people want. But he says, this is what God is saying. If, now the ball's in your court. That's not my fault. I'm not any better than you. I'm not trying to throw my weight around. God told me this. This is what I think he said to me when he called me out of my work, took me into the desert. This is the word of the Lord. 
That's the business of a prophet. He doesn't say, what do you think? And these are thoughts I had in my bedroom. Now, I want to get this all out so, that you're, so everybody will know I'm not trying to uh, hold myself above you. The kingdom works with fire. Imagine Elijah, Elijah <laughs> and Elisha in sensitivity training as they were with the other Israelites saying, now, we're no different from you. And uh, it is, uh, there is times that I feel angry. There are actually times uh, that I feel angry. And I want to confess this and get this out to the group. That's not the way God works. That's not the way the kingdom works. And Paul was an adversary, even to Peter. He said to Peter, and I rebuked him in front of everybody. And then he fought with somebody over John Mark. And then when they went up to the council at, at Jerusalem, it was hardly an encounter group. It was a bunch of tough nuts, highly indiv individualistic type people that God knew he could put them someplace and they would change reality around them. They would change what was around them. They were not pussycats. They were not weeping worlds. They had the same hopes, fears, and dreams of everybody else. But in addition to that, there was a fire in their bones. The saith the Lord! Without asking anybody, do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> and I don't want to lose God's fire. And I don't want to get into any super kind of humanism. But I do see the value of confession of sins. That's what I say. I see the value of relationships. And I know that ultimately in God, in Jesus, we lose our individuality, but we always maintain our identity. But this, this encounter stuff has a different quality to it. Now, um, I hope this helps somebody. Some of you probably have already thought about this and wondered about it. But uh, in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 5, he says, uh, he, he says this. Um, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem. I know you can't find the Song of Solomon, but I don't have much more time. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you will not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Now, here you have a distinction between the daughters of Jerusalem on the one hand and this only one of her mother, this first fruits of the bride, on the other. And the Lord is saying to the daughters of Jerusalem, leave that girl alone. Don't wake her up. Now again, you find the same thing even more strongly expressed in Song of Solomon 8, verse 4. I want you to swear, O daughters of Jerusalem. I want an oath from you. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 4. I want an oath from you. Do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Now what that says to me is this. Every person, every human being has a natural dignity. And by the way, these encounter things tend to take away your dignity. They tend, the dignity then becomes something where I'm concealing myself from people, so I'll abandon my dignity and cast myself on the group. And if we're basically insecure, have a victim complex, or otherwise want to please, we're ready to take out our lungs and our liver and put them out on the table for, for people to see if they're okay. And you know, this is a little, uh, it's not strength, it's not real strength. All right, he's saying, I want you to swear. Now, as I see it, every human being has within him a garden. We're born that way. We have a garden. We have a garden inside of us. We have a place there that is holy, that is sacred. It's a holy of holies within the human being. We, no child realizes this. No child has any notion of this. We don't realize this until we get older, and we begin to realize somewhere in me is a private place. It's a garden. And you know what I believe? I believe this encounter stuff is an attempt of the devil through human beings to get into that garden. And I don't think they have any business there. That's your place. But there is someone who does have a place there. And he's paid for it with his blood. And he has a right to that garden. And that's Jesus. And he doesn't awaken you until you please. He deals with you as you're saved and baptized with the Spirit and begin to grow. And there comes a time in your life when you feel, God, it's, I'm sick and tired of trying to be a super spiritual hero. There's something in me that is not complete. 
And I think that's the moment the Lord is waiting for. The moment the Lord breaks our heart. Up to that, up to that time, we may be a ball of fire. But there comes a time in some way that the Lord breaks your heart. And it opens the door of that garden. And the Lord comes in. The Lord comes into that garden. And he brings us into oneness, into marriage with himself. And union with the Father. And I don't believe we should ever open those doors to any human being until we know what we're doing in God. Until Jesus says, okay, I'm settled here. The Father settled here. You're settled here. Now. I will bring in who I want. And I think this encounter stuff and, and, and covenant when it's used in the wrong way is too close for my comfort to opening up prematurely the human being. And you know what the result of that will be? The ultimate result of humanism. People join together in perfect harmony without the Lord. People who have found their soul's identity and security and health and joy and happiness in other people. The need within them for union has been satisfied with human beings. And the Lord is on the outside. Pray about it with me because many... Christians are going into this because today we're threatened. We want approval. We want security. We want holiness. But this, don't get into it in the prayer groups, is my suggestion. Until we pray more about this and think about this, I've discussed it with Pastor James and Chad, told them that my initial apprehension that we not get into something. See, whenever God is leading us towards something wonderful and of him, there's always the devil there with a counterfeit to try to pick us off. You know, ever notice that? Before we get the real stuff. So let's think hard about this. And when you're on the right track, you'll be able to know because you'll feel peace in your heart. You'll feel right. You said, that's right. That, I was really uncomfortable with telling people, you know, everything I know is, well, I don't know if it makes you uncomfortable. It does me. But when you get it right, you're going to feel right. Shall we stand? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Lord, you've heard the words that have been said. Father, our intention is not to cast a stumbling block before any soul in this building. Lord, but rather to aid and abet and enhance and develop and strengthen their, their desire for you, Lord. Their desire to pray their desire for union and fellowship with God and with one another. Lord, is our intention that each one enter into peace and joy and to the waters of Shiloh that run softly to peace, Lord. And Lord, frankly, I'm apprehensive, Jesus, about our getting together in the assumption, in the assumption that if we become one, then God will be one. And Lord, I don't see it in the book. I don't see it. Lord, I see rather you're picking out individuals and revealing yourself to them, and working in that way rather than by a group. That's what I see, Lord. So we need help, Lord. And I pray that on many of us, Lord, will be an increased desire to pray. And Lord, you'll keep us from, from not doing things that are going to harm, that are going to crush people, that are going to cause us, Lord, to dig holes and fall in them that we'll be a long time getting out of. Lord, we need your help. We need wisdom. And Lord, we want to be pioneers. We want to cast out the stones. We want to open up the highway, Lord, that a whole generations of people can come, Lord, without having to do what we have done, without having to fall in all these things, Lord, and make mistakes, but they can come singing, Lord, on the highway to Zion. And, they, and Lord, and they can read the message and run with it, hallelujah, on a clear and uncluttered highway, right straight to the heart of God. So help us, Lord, you've called us in rigorous times. You called us in days of witchcraft, in days of Satan worship. You called us in the days of the maturing of the terrors, Lord. And Lord, it's going to be a struggle and a battle and a fight. 
And we know that you want mighty men, heroes, men of war, men that can compass around your King David. Hallelujah. The greater David, praise your name. And be part of his itinerary as he comes. Mighty men of war, of valor that can stand and put 10,000 to flight. Blessed be your name, Lord. Help us to be tough and to be strong and to carry on in this day, Lord, and not to faint as we see the things approaching, Lord, but to stand up and know that he that is greater than all has called us to be prophets in the world in which we live. Praise your name, Lord. While we're in prayer, there may be someone today that just feels a, a, a special need. Uh, you have fainted and you're, or you're frightened. And we want to pray about that this morning. Praise the Lord. We don't want anyone in here afraid or frightened. We've been hearing tales about...